Recording by Leone Rose From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne Chapter 25 Final Details It was the 22nd of November. The departure was to take place in ten days. One operation alone remained to be accomplished to bring all to a happy termination. An operation delicate and perilous, requiring infinite precautions, and against the success of which Captain Nicholl had laid his third bet. It was, in fact, nothing less than the loading of the Columbiad, and the introduction into it of four hundred thousand pounds of gun-cotton. Nicholl had thought, not perhaps without reason, that the handling of such formidable quantities of peroxyl would, in all probability, involve a grave catastrophe, and at any rate, that this immense mass of eminently inflammable matter would inevitably ignite when submitted to the pressure of the projectile. There were indeed dangers accruing, as before, from the carelessness of the Americans. But Barbicane had set his heart on success, and took all possible precautions. In the first place, he was very careful as to the transportation of the gun-cotton to Stones Hill. He had it conveyed in small quantities, carefully packed in sealed cases. These were brought by rail from Tampa Town to the camp, and from thence were taken to the Columbiad by barefooted workmen, who deposited them in their places by means of cranes placed at the orifice of the cannon. No steam engine was permitted to work, and every fire was extinguished within two miles of the works. Even in November they feared to work by day, lest the sun's rays acting on the gun-cotton might lead to unhappy results. This led to their working at night, by light produced in a vacuum by means of Ruhmkorff's apparatus, which threw an artificial brightness into the depths of the Columbiad. There the cartridges were arranged with the utmost regularity, connected by a metallic thread, destined to communicate to them all simultaneously the electric spark, by which means this mass of gun-cotton was eventually to be ignited. By the 28th of November, 800 cartridges had been placed in the bottom of the Columbiad. So far the operation had been successful. But what confusion, what anxieties, what struggles were undergone by President Barbicane! In vain had he refused admission to Stones Hill. Every day the inquisitive neighbors scaled the palisades, some even carrying their imprudence to the point of smoking while surrounded by bales of gun-cotton. Barbicane was in a perpetual state of alarm. J. T. Maston seconded him to the best of his ability, by giving vigorous chase to the intruders, and carefully picking up the still lighted cigar ends which the Yankees threw about. A somewhat difficult task, seeing that more than three hundred thousand persons were gathered round the enclosure. Michael Arden had volunteered to superintend the transport of the cartridges to the mouth of the Columbiad, but the President, having surprised him with an enormous cigar in his mouth, while he was hunting out the rash spectators to whom he himself offered so dangerous an example, saw that he could not trust this fearless smoker, and was therefore obliged to mount a special guard over him. At last, Providence being propitious, this wonderful loading came to a happy termination, Captain Nichols' third bet being thus lost. It remained now to introduce the projectile into the Columbiad, and to place it on its soft bed of gun-cotton. But before doing this, all those things necessary for the journey had to be carefully arranged in the projectile vehicle. These necessaries were numerous, and had Arden been allowed to follow his own wishes, there would have been no space remaining for the travellers. 
it is impossible to conceive of half the things this charming Frenchman wished to convey to the moon, a veritable stock of useless trifles. But Barbicane interfered, and refused admission to anything not absolutely needed. Several thermometers, barometers, and telescopes were packed in the instrument case. The travelers, being desirous of examining the moon carefully during their voyage, in order to facilitate their studies, they took with them Boer and Moodler's excellent Mappa Selenographica, a masterpiece of patience and observation, which they hoped would enable them to identify those physical features in the moon with which they were acquainted. This map reproduced with scrupulous fidelity the smallest details of the lunar surface which faces the earth. The mountains, valleys, craters, peaks, and ridges were all represented, with their exact dimensions, relative positions, and names. From the mountains Dorfel and Leibniz on the eastern side of the disk, to the Mare Frigoris of the North Pole. They also took three rifles and three fowling pieces, and a large quantity of balls, shot, and powder. We cannot tell whom we shall have to deal with, said Marco Arden. Men or beasts may possibly object to our visit. It is only wise to take all precautions. These defensive weapons were accompanied by pickaxes, crowbars, saws, and other useful implements, not to mention clothing adapted to every temperature, from that of polar regions to that of the torrid zone. Arden wished to convey a number of animals of different sorts, not indeed a pair of every known species, as he could not see the necessity of acclimatizing serpents, tigers, alligators, or any other noxious beasts in the moon. Nevertheless, he said to Barbicane, some valuable and useful beasts, bullocks, cows, horses, and donkeys, would bear the journey very well, and would also be very useful to us. I dare say, my dear Arden, replied the President, but our projectile vehicle is no Noah's Ark, from which it differs both in dimensions and object. Let us confine ourselves to possibilities. After a prolonged discussion, it was agreed that the travelers should restrict themselves to a sporting dog belonging to Nickel and to a large Newfoundland. Several packets of seeds were also included among the necessaries. Michael Arden, indeed, was anxious to add some sacks full of earth to sow them in. As it was, he took a dozen shrubs carefully wrapped up in straw to plant in the moon. The important question of provision still remained, it being necessary to provide against the possibility of their finding the moon absolutely barren. Barbicane managed so successfully that he supplied them with sufficient rations for a year. These consisted of preserved meats and vegetables, reduced by strong hydraulic pressure to the smallest possible dimensions. They were also supplied with brandy, and took water enough for two months, being confident, from astronomical observations, that there was no lack of water on the moon's surface. As to provisions, doubtless the inhabitants of the earth would find nourishment somewhere in the moon. Arden never questioned this. Indeed, had he done so, he would never have undertaken the journey. Besides, he said one day to his friends, we shall not be completely abandoned by our terrestrial friends. They will take care not to forget us. No, indeed, replied J. T. Maston. Nothing would be simpler, replied Arden. The Columbiad will be always there. Well, Whenever the moon is in a favorable condition as to the zenith, if not to the perigee, that is to say, about once a year, could you not send us a shell packed with provisions, which we might expect on some appointed day? Hurrah, hurrah! cried J. T. Matson. What an ingenious fellow! What a splendid idea! Indeed, my good friends, we shall not forget you. I shall reckon upon you. Then you see... We shall receive news regularly from the earth, 
and we shall indeed be stupid if we hit upon no plan for communicating with our good friends here. These words inspired such confidence that Michael Arden carried all the gun club with him in his enthusiasm. What he said seemed so simple and so easy, so sure of success, that none could be so sordidly attached to this earth as to hesitate to follow the three travelers on their lunar expedition. All being ready at last, it remained to place a projectile in the Columbiad, an operation abundantly accompanied by dangers and difficulties. The enormous shell was conveyed to the summit of Stones Hill. There, powerful cranes raised it and held it suspended over the mouth of the cylinder. It was a fearful moment. What if the chain should break under its enormous weight? The sudden fall of such a body would inevitably cause the gun cotton to explode. Fortunately, this did not happen and some hours later the projectile vehicle descended gently into the heart of the cannon and rested on its couch of peroxyle, a veritable bed of explosive eiderdown. Its pressure had no result other than the more effectual ramming down of the charge in the Columbiad. "'I have lost,' said the captain, who forthwith paid President Barbicane the sum of three thousand dollars." Barbicane did not wish to accept the money from one of his fellow travelers, but gave way at last before the determination of Nicol, who wished before leaving the earth to fulfill all his engagements. No, said Michael Arden, I have only one thing more to wish for you, my brave captain. What is that? asked Nicol. It is that you may lose your two other bets. Then we shall be sure not to be stopped on our journey. End of chapter 25 Recording by Leonie Rose